الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم ما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ياسين والقرآن الحكيم إنك لمن المرسلين على صراط مستقيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أمين رب العالمين So I want to start today inshallah ta'ala first of all for thanking you for coming in so early I know this is almost Fajr time for a lot of you on Saturday <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I understand that it's, it's difficult to make the kind of sacrifice and I appreciate the amount of time inshallah that you'll be putting in Hopefully the day that we spend together is going to go by rather quickly and we're not going to get bored inshallah I'm actually pretty excited to have the opportunity to be here and to be able to teach uh, some lessons from this incredible incredible surah I was actually done prepari- preparing completely and then I decided I need to prepare again so I just finished preparing at 10.30 this morning. I almost didn't sleep last night. So, but that's just how excited I am about Surah Yasin. I wanted to do it as much justice as I possibly could, even though the best of my efforts don't even come close to the infinite wisdom in every ayah of the Qur'an. Now I want to start today, inshallah, by giving you guys a little bit of a, an introduction to the approach for today's program. Uh, not just the schedule and the breaks and all of that, but actually the, what we're going to be doing and how I'm going to be approaching the study of the Surah. So uh, when I study a surah nowadays uh, in depth, when I try to study it in depth myself and some of my assistants and research partners, we take on as many tafasir as we can. We look, look at different mufassirun and what they've said. We look at different linguistic sources, dictionaries, etc., etc., and put all these massive notes together under each ayah. So there's lots and lots and lots of information under every ayah. What did Imam Ibn Kathir say? What did Al-Qurtubi say? Rahimahumullah. What did Ibn Ashur say? What did Razi say? What does the Sanan Arab say? Etc. 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 So when you're studying one ayah, there's like 20 pages of notes. Okay? And then you have to kind of study all of that and make sense of it. But that's not what we're doing here. That's actually my job. My job as a student is to do that. But my job as a teacher is completely different. I'm not here to tell you this book says this and that book says that and that book says that. That's actually not why I'm here at all. Okay? My job is to study that stuff, process that information, and think about how I would take the best of that information that I've understood and then talk to my, if I had, now she's in her 20s, but my younger sister. Okay? To talk to her who has no Arabic background, who has no you know, Islamic studies background. And I want to take all this stuff that these great scholars talked about and these incredible insights, but I have to talk about it in a way, even if there was a non-Muslim sitting in the audience, they'd get it, they'd understand. So it's a pretty tough job taking you know, heavy academic stuff and then putting it in language that is easy to understand, inshallah. I don't, you know, and I don't want it to come across as, even though I'm not quoting a lot of Mufassirun, because some of you, mashallah, have background in Islamic studies. So if you hear me talk and I'm not gonna quote any tafsir or tell you which Sahabi said what, or which, which, you know, is, what's the isnad of that hadith, etc. You might think that uh, it's is coming from nowhere. It is actually coming from somewhere. And hopefully the intention now, because all of that research is being compiled, is that these lectures can be supplemented with all of those notes for those people who want to do the studies. Because the research is already done. For those people that want to do the, you know, the, the heavy lifting and the geeky studies and go through the Arabic sources, welcome to you, inshallah ta'ala. But that's not for the rest of us. So that's the first thing about the approach of today's program. I'm going to try to simplify things and try to make them as accessible as possible. Bismillah. The second thing is, just to give you an outline, the surah that we're studying today, Surah Yasin, is made up of six sections. It's made up of six parts, which means that we're going to try to do at least six sessions. Each section, we'll try to cover in one session. That's what we're gonna try to do. Even though there are more sessions after that. When we finish the six sections, then we have to look back again and figure some things out that we're missing. So we probably have one or two sections to cover after we're done with all six of the sections of this beautiful surah. So let's just uh, get started right away because we do have a lot of work to cover. It's 83 ayahs, it's a lot, a lot of work. So let's begin inshallah ta'ala, Surah Yaseen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Yaseen A surah that was revealed in the, the Meccan period Before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrated to Medina And in this surah Allah begins with the letters Ya and Seen Which is the only time these letters occur You've heard of Alif, Lam, Mim before Or you know Kaf, Ha, Ya, Ain, Saad etc So there are many surahs of the Quran that begin with these letters What they all have in common Or at least what most of them have in common Is that they all begin with these letters And then they say something about the Quran like the, you get these letters, alif, lam, mim, and then Allah says something about the Qur'an, like ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْوَ فِيهِ Or تِلْكَ آيَاتُ الْكِتَابِ الْمُبِينَ Something. 
In some way, all of these are introductions to the Qur'an. Like one of the things these letters have in common, for the most part, they are introductions to the Qur'an. One obvious exception, of course, is, you know, غُلِبَتِ uh, الرُّومِ Alif Lam Mim غُلِبَتِ الرُّومِ Rome was dominated. Rome was overcome. And in my mind, even though that's an exception, it's actually along the same lines, and you know why? Because even that is the description of a miracle of Allah. When Rome was dominated, and then eventually the Persians, you know, and, and, and Persians had, had taken over them, and Allah said, within 10 years, they're going to win again. Within 10 years, they're go going to make a comeback, even though they were completely annihilated. And that was a prediction the Qur'an made well in advance. It was talking, it, it made a challenge to humanity, see if this doesn't happen. It put its entire validity on the line. Like, you know, if Allah says in the Qur'an that the Roman Empire that was defeated by the Persian Empire is going to make a comeback within 10 years, and the only place that's talking about this is a man in the desert in Arabia, and if, he, if this doesn't turn out to be the case, then everything about the Qur'an can be questioned. Everything can be questioned. So you've put the entire credibility of the message of Islam on the line with one statement. You know? with just one, one, one claim. And actually that's exactly the same with the Qur'an itself. Why don't you produce something like this Qur'an? Why don't you show that it's not from Allah? It actually challenges you to question its credibility every time. So in that sense, it does have it in common with all of the other huruf. One more thing about these huruf muqatta'at, even though I don't want to spend too much time on the words Yasin. I know some people, you, you guys have heard that Surah Yasin is the heart of the Qur'an. You must have heard that before. Uh, actually, may, maybe some of you are, mostly that's the reason you're here, because you're Pakistani and you've <laughs> heard that your whole life. So, <laughs> um, that's actually not an authentic narration, even though it's beautiful, and we're not rejecting it, because it's part of our tradition. But it's not actually something authentically proven that it's considered the heart of the Qur'an. It did become famous though. And it's good, at least we know one, we care about one surah at least, so that's good. You know, <laughs> it turned out great for the subcontinent. Um, so <laughs> but in any case, what it, you know, the thing about the letters is that, something to keep in mind is that these letters were unfamiliar to the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa This is really important. Our Prophet, proudly the Qur'an declares, is incapable of reading. Ummi. He is as, as unlettered as someone who just came out of their mother. That's why the word Ummi is used. You know? And so the one who cannot read, وَمَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكَ وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبْلِهِ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَمَا تَخُطُّهُ بِيَمِينِكَ You didn't write this with your own hands, and you didn't, you didn't read anything but before this ever. And you didn't write it with your own hands. And now someone who doesn't read and write doesn't know anything about the alphabet. If you only know how to speak a language and somebody says to you, W, what does that mean to you? It doesn't mean anything to you. So the fact that he's saying, Ya Asin, which in Arabic doesn't mean anything except to someone who knows what? Reading and writing. So they know that's a letter, Ya, and that's a letter, C. For someone who doesn't know that, this is completely beyond his capability. So the very use of the letters Ya Asin is telling the audience that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa seems to be getting an education. Because the only time you learn letters is when you're receiving an education. Which makes the question, who's educating him? Because if you say he's, he knows these letters, that means he's getting taught. And then arrives the question, well who's teaching him? And so every time these letters occur, the question pops up, who taught him that one? Who taught him this? And then every time, what does Allah do? Or at least with one exception, what does He do? He answers who taught him. It's the book, it's the revelation, it's coming from Allah. So that's some, some things about the words Yaseen. Now let's get to the heart of the matter. This is really going to be from the beginning to the end. This is the ayah that we're going to keep coming back to. Qur'an al hakim Allah swears, He says, I swear by, that's how I'm going to translate the word wa. I swear by the Hakim Qur'an. I'm not going to translate it as wise yet. I'm going to say, I swear by the Hakim Qur'an. So even though you guys don't know Arabic, many of you, it's okay. I'm going to try to explain the word Hakim to you. Because that's going to play a big role. But before I do, what does Allah do with the, the wise Qur'an, or the Hakim Qur'an rather? He says He swears by it. So we have to understand what does it mean to swear by something? Why would He do that? The Qur'an is special in why it swears by something. And I'm going to highlight the only, th the only thing about taking an oath or swearing that is unique to the Qur'an. Because you and I take oaths too. Oh my God, I swear to God, I'm going to, mm -mm, you know. We do that too. But when the Qur'an does it, it does it for a unique reason. And I want you to understand that first. 
The Quran does it first of all to get your attention, to get your attention, and it, it gets your attention using something unique, something that you want to think about. But there's more. It gets your attention using something, and whatever that is becomes evidence for what he's about to say. Now that sounds complicated, but let me make it simple. He says, I swear by time. Wal asr, yes? I swear by time. So he swore by what? Time. You can call it out. It's halal. It's not a khutbah. Your good deeds will not be burnt away. Okay? So he swears by what? Time. Which means time, he is, he, it's almost as though he's saying, I am making time itself evidence. I'm turning time into evidence. Evidence for what? Inna al insana lafi khus. That no doubt the human being is in loss. The biggest proof that human beings are in loss is what? Time. You see? So the statement that will come later is being proven by the oath. So when Allah says, Wal Quran al Hakim, the Quran is being used as a proof. It's being used as evidence. Just like time was being used as evidence, now the Quran is being used by evidence for something. We'll get to what that is, but right now let's talk about Wal Quran al Hakim. Al Hakim actually has three meanings in Arabic. It can have three meanings, and all three of them apply to the Quran. The first of them, it slipped out as I was talking to you, is wisdom. The Quran is full of wisdom. You know, wisdom comes with old age. Wisdom comes in very complicated language. Wisdom is always appreciated by those who it's relevant to. Like if I talk to you about some wisdom and it flies over your head, you don't really think that's wisdom. But if I give you some advice that really benefits you, then you appreciate its wisdom. So to, in order to appreciate wisdom, it has to be relevant. And the fact that every time the Qur'an the, is recited by the Prophet ﷺ, somebody listening can immediately get hit with it and say, whoa, that's talking about me. It's giving me advice, it's relevant to me. It's giving me counsel that I totally needed. So the Qur'an calls its wisdom one of its proofs. It's, it's evidence to something, something bigger. It's way too wise to be a human being's effort. That's the second, now the second meaning. Hakim also has the meaning of dhil uh, hukum, meaning the thing that has the power to give verdicts or judgment. You know the word hukum or hakim? Hakim also means ruler or governor. So the Quran that is full of judgment. Now the thing is, uh, me as a human being, I can tell you personally, even in my life of Quran studies, there are opinions I used to have that I no longer have. There are things that I used to hold to be absolutely true, I don't see them anymore that way. As you study, you learn more and your opinions change. Even lawyers that eventually become judges, if they remember back when they were lawyers, they studied the same constitution, but the way they thought about it changed or no? It changed, they mature over time. People mature and think differently over time. The Quran, however, gives judgments, and over the course of these 23 years, did anything change? Is there any maturity? Well, you know, we used to say that, but we don't say that anymore. No, 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 no. It's constant in its judgment. It doesn't, you know, waver from its verdict. And sometimes when you have an opinion, not even a verdict, when you have an opinion, it can get you in trouble. If the media is coming to your masjid asking you for an interview, you have to think really carefully about what you're gonna say. Because, you know, they, they might out, out fox you or something. So you, you have to be really careful. But when the Qur'an speaks, does it actually consider the consequences? Maybe I should not say this, it might get me in trouble. Maybe we should kind of circumvent it, maybe avoid that question. The Qur'an just takes it on and gives an open verdict. Like it's in a position of authority. Now the thing is, you need to understand here, there are two opposite things. The Prophet ﷺ is just one man, very few followers, not really in any political position. Not really a military behind nothing. And Allah is the Almighty, all powerful, who's in the unseen. But when, when the Prophet speaks, والسلام, he speaks on behalf of Allah. So he speaks like a judge with hukum. But he's not in a position to talk like that because he's not a governor, he's not, he's not ruling the people. He's not in a position of power, but when he speaks, he speaks like he's in a position of power because he's speaking on behalf of Allah. But when someone who is not in a position of power speaks like they're in a position of power, they get in a lot of trouble. You cannot talk like that unless you have power. But the Quran says it speaks like this 
from the mouth of this messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and it does so constantly you know maybe sometimes a student acts out and speaks up against the teacher or an employee raises his voice against the employer or a you know plaintiff sitting in a courtroom raises his voice against the judge or a police officer raises his voice against the police chief or one of the staffers at the white house raises his voice against the president but that happens one time and then he just says, okay sorry 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 I didn't realize it got out of hand happens or no but with the Quran, it raises its voice. And there are those in leadership that get offended. But does it apologize? No, it does it again. And then it does it again. And does it again. This is the second meaning of the word Hakim. It's authoritative. It gives verdicts and it doesn't care. And it does it every time. What was the first meaning? Wisdom. wisdom. It's full of wisdom. Constant wisdom. And then the second, it gives verdicts without consideration. And then there's a third meaning, my favorite one. It has to do with the word ihkam or muhkam in Arabic. Ihkam actually means to tighten something and to make a weave. You know, like knitting and things like that. There's a pattern. So when you have a long pattern, it's actually called ihkam. When things are tight together, they're also called ihkam. When something is you know, completely finished, like for example, they have some work done on these walls, right? So if this wall, if it's unfinished, it's not muhkam. But it's completely finished and all the corners are perfectly done and it's completely symmetrical. Then it's called hakim also. That's one of the meanings of it. In other words, the Quran is way too well knit. Everything connects to everything else way too perfectly. You know, and sometimes in politicians give speeches, they have speech writers. <laughs> right? Like the president doesn't write his own speeches. He has a speech writer. But his opposition can take a speech from five years ago Take out a clip and say, hey, in 2010 you said this, and now you're saying this. Even though that one had a speechwriter too, but he messed up. And now they're, they're holding it against him. Does that happen? But you know what? This Quran is too tightly knit, so you can't say, hey, what about this? You said that over here, but you're saying this over here. It all just connects perfectly. And all of what, he, what the Qur'an says connects perfectly with what the Prophet himself says Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam It's completely well knit That is the third meaning So let's review this again What are the three meanings of Wal Qur'an al-Hakim? Wisdom it's, It gives verdicts And it's too well knit It's perfectly knit together It's tight together There's no looseness in it There's no one word that kind of slipped out Everything is perfect and tight And exactly where it's supposed to be it is way too perfect. Now, but all of this is proof of something. What is it a proof of? It is a proof of the fact that you, no doubt, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you, meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are no doubt from those that have been sent. This Qur'an is the ultimate proof that you have to have, this could not be yourself. There's no way this is your, on your own. So now we have to understand why is this proof? This is way too much wisdom for one human being. It's impossible. There are way too many authoritative verdicts. No human being ever does that and does it year after year, day after day, getting himself in more and more trouble. Any human being that speaks and gets in trouble, the next day they speak more or speak less? less. They speak less, they back off, or they change the subject, or they move to another town. He keeps going after the same people, offending them more and more and more. There's no way you're doing this because you want to. You are being told to do this. You are from those that have been sent. Not even on your own. You have been pushed to go. You've been given a mission. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the third was it's too tight. In other words, people know how you speak. But this speech, this Quran is not like any speech. I, I want you to appreciate that from a communication psychology point of view. It's really cool. Right now I'm speaking to you. I'm not reading to you. But if I actually opened up a tafsir book, Right? Or if I had Google glasses or something And they were just scrolling in front of me And I was reading the tafsir book Or I memorized some Shakespeare And I was reading it to you Would you know that that's not my speech? Would you know that I'm actually not talking But rather reading? You would know Because the way I speak And the way Shakespeare speaks Or the way the constitution speaks Or the way my own essay speaks is different Actually the way I speak is not even the way I write When I write it's much more formal and when I speak, it's much more informal. The Prophet ﷺ has papers in front of him or no? No. no. There's no he can't, and even if he did, it wouldn't matter. Why not? Because he can't read. But when he starts reciting Qur'an, 
Everybody can tell this is way too tightly knit. There are no, there are no, uh, mm, let me repeat that. There's nothing. It's too perfect for this to be a human being's speech. This is, this is not him. This is some other author. So now in this ayah, another thing to understand is that Allah says, you, ha you're the, you are among those that has been sent. But that creates a question. The question that it creates is sent by who? Allah does not say, إِنَّكَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ مِنَ اللَّهِ He doesn't add مِنَ اللَّهِ He doesn't say, you are, the, you are among the sent from Allah. Allah has not yet been mentioned at all. All that's been mentioned is, there's this Qur'an, it's an incredible recital, it's so full of wisdom, it's so bold in the way it gives verdicts, it's so tightly knit, this can't be his, he has to have been sent by somebody. We don't know who that is yet. You understand? So the, the mystery has been created, but it hasn't been answered. And before we go on, one more thing about this, this, or three more things actually. Three more things about إِنَّ كَلَّمِنَ الْمُرْسَيْ Here's the second thing. Who is Allah talking to? He says, no doubt you are from those that have been sent. So who's He talking to? He's talking to the Prophet Instead of talking to the Quraysh and telling them, no doubt He is from the messengers. He's from the ones that are sent. He's not even talking to them. He's not even talking to the disbeliever. He's talking to the Prophet himself Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know why? Because the disbelievers call him a liar. The disbelievers call him insane. They call him all these things. And you know when somebody calls you crazy? Like, how could you do that? But another person calls you crazy? Then another person calls you crazy? Then a hundred people call you crazy? What might you start thinking? Maybe I am crazy. One person calls you a liar, another calls you a liar, your uncle calls you a liar, your cousin calls you a liar, your business partner calls you a liar, your neighbor calls you a liar. People who don't even know you on the street call you a liar. You, it might start affecting you, isn't it? You need someone to say, you know what, don't listen to what they're saying. I'm telling you you're not a liar. I'm telling you you're not insane. I'm telling you you're not evil. You need to listen to me and forget everything else they're saying. You know, this is the idea of propaganda. They say on the news, Muslims are this, 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 this. I mean, there's a long list of things Muslims are. You know? We, we make people really nervous at airports and in elevators. People get, even the flight on an elevator is uncomfortable for people. And just, just yesterday, I got, I got in the elevator and there was a, a family and I pressed the floor for my elevator and they didn't press anything. So I assumed that they're on the same floor. <laughs> And when I, when the, the, the time came as a courtesy because they're just women and kids. So I said, you know, go ahead. They said, no, 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 go ahead. <laughs> I was like, okay. And then they pressed the button and pressed the close multiple times. Like, okay. <laughs> Propaganda works, dude. Propaganda works. It's pretty awesome, you know. So now, what I'm saying is, it can even affect you. By the way, are even Muslims affected by propaganda? Against themselves? Do we start seeing ourselves in a negative image? Sure. We start apologizing for being who we are. We start asking our own Imams questions that usually non-Muslims ask us. Why are we like this? Why do we say that? What does the Quran say? You know, they say, why does the Quran say that? <laughs> and then you go, why is Quran Pak saying this? And you know, like, it's the same question. <laughs> why are you asking the same question as the you know, but you know what the Prophet's being told Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's being told, you don't need validation from anywhere else. I am telling you, you are from those who have been sent. You don't need anybody else's validation. You have mine. That's enough for you. None of the peer pressure counts anymore. But he didn't just say, you are, this is my third point now. He didn't just say, you are a messenger. He said, you are from among the ones who are sent. What does that mean? That means that he's not alone. Because if I tell you, you are from among the Muslims, then there's a large group of Muslims. When you tell him you're from among the ones that are sent, then there must be others that are sent. So now the Prophet is being told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as alone as you feel, there are people that I will introduce you to, or that I am introducing you to, that are part of the same team, you are part of a larger brotherhood, and, you, and when you have people that belong to the same group as you, then you find support in them. Like if you live, some people live in the United States, there's like they don't see any Muslim in the university, or they don't see any Muslim at the at workplace. Then they're going grocery shopping, and the, you know, they see one guy. 
one guy who clearly visibly looks Muslim, he's like reviewing Fatiha or something. <laughs> and they get so happy because I have some support. Somebody else like me. When the Prophet ﷺ is the messenger, he's the only messenger. But Allah is saying, yes, previous messengers went back. They're gone a long time ago. But He will bring them back to life with His words. Allah will bring previous prophets back to life when He will talk about them. And you will find your support and your comfort in them. So the first val validation or comfort is from Allah. I'm telling you, you're from among those who are sent. And second of all, He's been given a hint. Listen, you're part of a team. You're part of a brotherhood. And you will find support in them. Obviously you need support when people doubt you. And that's why the word inna is used in the beginning. No doubt about it. You are from those who have been sent. Because there are people who doubt. But you should never doubt. Now, the last point about the word, this ayah. إِنَّكَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ not all the ayat will be this long. Just don't get overwhelmed. We do have 83 ayat to get to. But I do want to establish the, the thought process of the surah in the beginning. And I also like to highlight how things are flowing from one to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. That's part of the job I have, inshallah. So the last thing I want to tell you about this ayah is that the word mursal is different from rasul. The word rasul means messenger. That's an easy translation, messenger. And some poor translations of the Qur'an also say you are from among the messengers. That's actually not correct. Mursal in Arabic, and ism maf'ul means the one who has been sent. Someone who's been sent. Now there's a difference between a messenger and someone who's been sent. If I'm a messenger, then I could be delivering a message on my own behalf. I could be. I could be the messenger of my own message. But if I'm someone who has been sent, then necessarily it means that the message I have is from somebody else. It's not from me. It's been, I've been charged with something. So now the, the Prophet is being told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's no doubt about it. You are, the, you are among the group of people that have been given a job. You have been sent with a mission. This is not something you're reciting because you like to or because you want to or because you have another agenda. Your primary objective is to be the slave of Allah and you are fulfilling His commandment. He started the book with Iqra' bismi rabbik. Read in the name of your master from the position of authority. You are under Allah's authority when you speak. Now, this is going to be really important later on but when it gets actually in the next ayah so I'll hold off to then. So this, the idea of the Prophet ﷺ having a duty. Not just that he's being comforted, he's also being reminded that he's on a mission. So no matter how much pressure he feels, he still has a job to do. And then you know, when you have a tough job, you need two things. You need someone to back you up and support you and say, we're gonna get through this, I got you, I got you. And that's done in this ayah. But at the same time, you need someone to remind you, listen, you only have four hours left. Get the job done. That's done in this ayah too. Both dimensions of your, what you need to get your job done are, are covered. On the one hand, the comforting and the support and the validation. And on the other hand, the reminder that, listen, this needs to get done. I know it's tough, but we're going to do it. That's it. There's no choice in the matter. <laughs> Shamsun <laughs> bihaa